Well, I haven't got a fancy title. I, I did try, but I've deleted them several times during the week. And uh, <clears throat> so, so I'm just going to call it Teach Us to Pray. And uh, that comes from Luke chapter 11 and verse 1. This is what it says. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Well, over the next few weeks, God willing, I'm going to do a series of talks, as I'm enabled, on one of the most important aspects of the Christian life. Prayer. Communication with God. Don't we have problems, even as human beings, communicating with each other? So communicating with God is so much more difficult, isn't it? And it seems too difficult to so many. So where better to start learning about it than looking at what Jesus actually taught us about it, about it. Our text shows that if we ask Jesus to teach us to pray, he is more than willing to teach us. The Lord's Prayer is one of the most famous prayers, and it is said in most churches most weeks, but do we realise just how powerful it actually is. Before we look at the prayer itself, however, we need to look at its setting to consider what the circumstances were that led our Lord to give it to us. It has been called the Disciples' Prayer. So that's my prayer and your prayer, isn't it? Are we all disciples? It's a prayer many of us learned in our childhood. It often holds a special place in our lives because it was taught to us by our mothers and our grandmothers who may no longer be with us. Their lips may have been silent many years, but the prayer they taught us in our childhood, we are still praying it. I wonder just how many times you've prayed it. It is possibly one of the most familiar things of life. And here lies the danger in that it becomes to us just mere words. And we just say it mechanically so may we say the Lord's Prayer without praying we're all familiar with the saying familiarity believes, uh, breeds contempt for example people who live in the Alps think nothing of the splendid scenery that we English people go hundreds of miles to see when I lived with my parents in York, all the time I lived there, I never once visited the most important building that people come to from all over the world to see. That's York Minster. And yet, when I left, 
I actually made a trip of hundreds of miles just to go and see it. There is a great danger in life that through our familiarity of things around us, they lose their beauty and appear commonplace. This is the danger we are all in regarding this pearl of prayers. It's one of the familiar things of life. And our very familiarity with it may have dulled our sense of its beauty. There is a danger of it becoming, instead of a real, throbbing, living prayer, it becomes cold, heartless, and a formal utterance. I am praying that the series of talks will enable us to rediscover the power contained in this prayer. And this will radically deepen our spiritual life. And we'll see God moving in our lives in ways which we have never done before. Are you excited about that? Because I am. <laughs> I believe it's possible, isn't it? How can we make the prayer more meaningful and powerful? Can we say an old thing in a new way? Originality consists not so much in discovering new truth as in making an old truth more real and vital. The painter, for example, does not invent the beauty of nature, which he depicts on his canvas. He simply brings it out and makes it clearly visible. The preacher sees wonders and glories of old and familiar things. Glories missed and unheeded, perhaps by those who have less time to read and ponder the grand old book. It is his business to bring them out, to show to his people the peerless beauty there is even in the most common and familiar things. Let's take, for example, buttercups and daisies. You know what I'm talking about? They're everywhere, aren't they? We can see them in fields and meadows, <laughs> even in our gardens. We cannot take a walk in the fields in the summer without treading hundreds of them underfoot. They're so cheap and common, that no one ever thinks of making a posy of daisies, unless it is our children. And even they often fling the little flowers away before they reach their homes. Yet, there is beauty in the daisy and glory in the buttercup. It is only familiar, familiarity that has made us blind. Perhaps we would think them beautiful if they were as rare as orchards, orchids. And even as it is, we need only listen to a lover of flowers as he describes to us the delicacy and the beauty of the daisy and the buttercup to realise that even these, the commonest flowers that bloom, will reveal something of the glory of God. Probably there's no form of words so absolutely and universally familiar as the Lord's Prayer. I am praying that the Lord will enable me to unpack to you some of its wonder and beauty and glory. There are in this familiar prayer heights we have never scaled and depths we have never sounded. I want, if I can, to help you to realise its meaning, to feel its power, to grasp the breadth of its demands, so that this 
the most familiar of all prayers may be on our lips and become ever more fresh and real and vital to each one of us so that we may pray not only with our lips but with the understanding also so that when we use these sacred words whether it be in public or private we may not simply repeat the Lord's Prayer but really and truly pray to bring out the full meaning of this familiar prayer to illustrate its truths and to point out the demands it makes that is the aim of the next few weeks as I seek to bring it to you in this message but first let me call your attention to the circumstances of the origin of the prayer Jesus had been praying he was a great man of prayer his favorite temple was the mountaintop away from the noise and the bustle of the town in the solitude of the mountain summit in the solemn hush and silence of the night Jesus Christ prayed no one can talk much with God without bearing visible results of that high fellowship for example Moses after he'd been on the mount with God came down with a countenance that caught and retained some of its divine character his face shone you might have heard of the late John G Patton the heroic missionary who tells in his autobiography how his saintly father would withdraw every day to talk with God and as children he and his brother used to notice and wonder about the wonderful light upon his father's face when he came from his time of prayer I hope you don't think me too fanciful when I say that I believe that the master's face in the morning <coughs> used to proclaim clearly that he'd been in sacred communion during the night with his father. The halo which we often see in the old paintings may be fancy, but I'm sure there would be a radiance about the Saviour's face, an aspect of such unperturbed serenity and calm on his countenance as would show to all that Jesus had been spending the night in holy fellowship with his father there were many things to try our Lord's life more he had more than ever any of us can ever dream of the malignant hatred of the Pharisees the persistent blundering of the disciples. And often when Jesus left the mountain, he was tired, worn and weary. But after his night of prayer, he always came down from the mountain peaceful, calm and strong. And I cannot help thinking that his disciples must have often noticed that expression of calm and peace on their master's face after his nights of prayer. It ignited within them the desire to pray in the same way that they saw him pray, so that they too might enjoy the same peace and strength I would like to point out that few are moved by clever sermons 
which profess to explain away the difficulties connected with prayer as they are by observing the effects of prayer in our lives. No testimony is more powerful than seeing Christians being calm and happy in the midst of difficulties and worries and cares of life. People want to know their secret so that they too will be led to pray. Surely this impacted the disciples as they spent time with Jesus. One day he had gone to pray and when he returned, one of the disciples asked him to teach him how to pray. They wanted to be in command of the secret of peace. They wanted to be in possession of the key to God's storehouse of power. And so they said, teach us to pray. And it was in answer to that request that Jesus gave them the pearl of prayers. If we look for a moment at this request from the disciples, we'll see that firstly, it is a confession of need. Don't we all have need? Teach us to pray. You might have heard people ask the question, why do people pray? If we ask that, we might as well ask, why does the nightingale sing? Why does the eagle soar into the boundless blue sky? Well, the nightingale sings because it was made to sing. The eagle soars away because its pinions were made for flight. And man prays because he was made for prayer. Teach us to pray. That is the cry of our hearts. As we know deep down that we will only be complete when our spiritual thirst is satisfied. We were made to commune with God. Let me quickly remind you that this is not a need which Christianity has created. Oh no, the need goes to the very core of our being. Only Christ can truly satisfy this need. Prayer is as old as man himself. Society today is very different from the primitive simplicity of society in the time of the patriarchs. But we are all alike, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in this respect. We all pray. The Bible is a book of prayers. It is the greatest prayer book in the world. All the prayers in it are not in the same spiritual level. In many you will find much that is mistaken. But there they are, the prayers of Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon, Elijah, Hezekiah, all bearing witness to the same need, the same deep instinct. But we must not limit prayer to the Bible as prayer found in all religions around the world. Indeed, it is the sense of this need that makes the wide world one. When an infant needs anything, what does it do? It cries. And the cry of the little one is a prayer. When we are in need of anything, we pray. We may pray a hundred different ways. We may utter no spoken word, but pray we must. It was because these 12 disciples felt that need that they made this request to Jesus almost 2,000 years ago. Secondly, this request of the disciples is a confession of ignorance. 
prayer was a necessity to them. But how were they to pray? What were they to pray for? These disciples felt that there might be a right and a wrong way of praying. That there might be a right and a wrong in the things prayed for. And they were right. Prayer is the key to the treasure house of God. But it will lie useless in our hands until we are shown how to use it. So here comes the confession of ignorance. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach me to pray. Is that the cry of your heart? The disciples wanted to know if there was an etiquette to prayer. They knew that if you wanted an audience with a great king, they just could not breeze in into his presence. Even if you have an audience with the Queen of England, there are certain court formalities to be observed. So how can we approach God in prayer? Do we need to be introduced to him? By what name should we address him? Jesus tells us, he tells his disciples that God knows them by their own names and they should not address him as king, judge or even lord. They were just to call him Father. Furthermore, these disciples didn't even know what they should pray for. They didn't know what they were to ask in their petitions. And neither do many of us. We might be called the sons and daughters of ignorance and night. Only God knows what is best for us. We certainly don't. I often think that if God wished to be unkind to us, he is only to answer our prayers. For we often ask for things that would do us harm. What parent would grant the request of a three-year-old for a Rockweiler dog? We are like little children in our ignorance. And I've often asked our Heavenly Father for things that would injure us. We have all of us to make this confession of ignorance. All of us must admit that we don't know what to pray for. We need to go to Jesus with this request. Lord, teach us to pray. He will tell us what to pray for. He will give us and tell us the needs. He will tell us how he shared to his father all his desires but ended every prayer with these words. You might know them. Luke 22 and verse 42. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus has also given us the assurance that whatever we ask of the Father in his name, as the spirit of prayers, as, uh, in the spirit as he prays, the Father will give it to us. Finally, let us realize that this request of the disciples is a confession that the old prayers are no longer good enough. Lord, teach us to pray. They said, had then these disciples never prayed before? Yes, many times, every day of their lives, and probably several times a day. I can imagine that before they were called to follow Jesus, they would have what the world uh, would call them religious men. 
In fact, we need not imagine it as we know it to be the case as several of them had been disciples of John the Baptist before they had become disciples of Jesus. The Jews were, we are told, particularly conscientious in the matter of prayer. Three times a day they withdrew for prayer. These disciples were good Jews and conscientious in regard for all points of ritual. So we are therefore justified in saying that the disciples all through their lives had paid attention to prayer. What then is the explanation for their request for Jesus to teach them how to pray? Well, the, expression, the explanation is simply this. The old prayers never satisfy them anymore. I was brought up in the Anglican church where they read all the prayers. I'm no longer in an Anglican church because those prayers no longer satisfied my heart. They had, the prayers had to come from inside as the Spirit speaks. Even the prayers of a godly man like John the Baptist had taught them seemed strangely empty and inappropriate. After living with Jesus, after hearing him preach, after listening to his words about God, the old stereotype prayers seemed to lose all their beauty and power. And the disciples felt that they could no longer pray them. They had received from Jesus a new revelation of God. And new, this new revelation of God created the need for a new prayer. There is an old ballad that you may have come across by Charlotte Allington Barnard, who lived from 1830 to 1869. The first line goes, I cannot sing the old songs. Anyone know it? It's a lovely... Get it on YouTube, you can find it there. Some change had taken in the singer's feelings that makes the old song inappropriate and impossible to sing. It was so with these disciples. They could not pray the old prayers because their hearts were changed. I think we all know something of this kind of feeling. Sometimes, for example, I might look back on some of my old sermons <laughs> and very often... I have to say to myself, I could not preach that again. <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> God has been teaching me during the years of my ministry and leading me into a fuller knowledge of the truth. That as in the sermons, as in well nigh everything else, time changes things. It was so with the twelve. They'd been to school to Christ from their great master. They'd learned many new and glorious lessons about God. They had outgrown the old prayers in which they had been brought up. They no longer expressed their feelings or satisfied their needs. The life of Paul is a good example of this. He was, as you know, a prominent man in religious circles before he became a Christian. He was painstaking in his observance of religious duties. After the strictest sect, he lived as a Pharisee. And if Pharisees were scrupulous about one thing more than any other, it was their prayers. Yet in the biblical account of his conversion, after describing him being alone and blind in the street called Straight, it adds this remark, 
as if recording a new fact in Saul's history. Behold, he prayeth. Saul had said his prayers thousands of times before, but now, for the first time, he was praying the new prayer, which, with a sense of his own sin and the gentleness of God, had made necessary. Oh, yes, when religion is a mere formality, then a prayer which is also formality, will suffice. But once we see the love of God and once we feel our own unworthiness, we shall find that old formal prayers will no longer be enough. We shall need a new prayer then. And these disciples shall come to Jesus with the request, Lord, teach us to pray. It is interesting to notice here what the disciples add. As John also taught his disciples, Jesus might imitate John in the act of teaching, but in the prayer that he taught, Jesus was not an imitator. Here Jesus was grandly and uh, supremely original. This was a new prayer that he gave. John could not have given it. No man, however saintly and good, could have given it. It surpasses the best efforts of man as the sunlight surpasses the starlight. No one but the sun who knew his heavenly father No one but the Son, who had intimate knowledge of the very heart of God, could have taught this prayer. For it opens with a new name for God, the name Father. And no one knows the Father but the Son. This short but perfect prayer is the Master's prayer answer to the request of his disciples Many people say that prayer is never answered. This pearl of prayers surely proves to them to be wrong. It was given in answer to prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. And the answer to his request was this prayer, which has met the needs expressed desires of God's people throughout all generations. My prayer is that this series of talks will open our eyes and our hearts and our spirits and we will come close to God than ever before. Can we say amen to that? (coughs) But I want to finish today by us all reading or saying the Lord's Prayer. Can we say it with our hearts? Not a formal prayer. Pray it through the Holy Spirit. Lord, ignite us now as we say this familiar prayer. May we say it in a way that we've never said it before as we ask it in and through your name. So let's pray this amazing prayer. Our Father, who art art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.